Welcome to Pastoral, the underscore art and jewelry podcast. I'm with Matt Flint today, who is a favorite gallery artist, newer in the roster for me because I've been doing this a long time, but um, already very well loved in our community. And we love having his work and we love getting the chance to talk to him about what he's been doing. So we're just going to kind of get a general feel for your background and how you approach making your art today. Um, and I'll start with the easy questions, um, which is to tell us, especially in your case, because you're not one of our actually local artists, uh, tell us about where you live and also where you grew up. Currently, I live in Lander, Wyoming, uh, at the base of the Wind River Mountains, Pop population of 7,000, a uh, tiny little town. I grew up in Missouri, uh, outside of Kansas City, in a rural area on a farm, uh, and kept moving from place to place looking for smaller and smaller places to be and that's how I ended up in Lander eventually so we we've lived there 20 years now were you drawn to the mountains or just the small community or what was the both uh, especially the small community and and mountains are sort of my um, my touchstone I guess you know um, I feel most comfortable by them so uh, right. even though you grew up on a farm in I know, Missouri. I know, but, but it was a farm where we had one neighbor, so I like mm -hmm. being outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gave me the chance to explore a little bit more um, moving out this way. Although we had, we had quite a lot of acreage, um, and so I got to, you know, kick around all day when I was younger, and I spent all my time outside uh, and making things. So, yeah, that's been yeah. a constant. It's a big change, though, to Wyoming from Missouri. Yeah, less trees. At least humidity-wise. <laughs> and less trees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what is your first memory of making art? I, I honestly, I don't remember. I know I've always made things, and I've always been a maker. Um, I think and this isn't necessarily art, but it's directly related to what I do. Uh, my dad gave me a little chunk of land and said, this is yours. Of course it wasn't, but um, in theory, this is yours. And he said, you can do whatever you want with it. And so it became sort of a, um, before I knew what uh, environmental artwork was, it became that. I had rocks and like a wheelbarrow and uh, I would build these little I don't know, pathways and roads and tree houses and things like that. And it was this ever evolving uh, construction area. Very cool. Um, How old were you? Uh, probably seven or eight and that I mean we we sort of got to do whatever we wanted on when our property. When you say a little chunk of land like quarter of an acre probably yeah, so yeah. pretty yeah. big for yeah. you know for city dwellers yeah 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 <laughs> that's awesome I love that actually I grew up sort of free-ranging on I grew up on Woods Bay Point down on Flathead Lake but um there weren't very many neighbors yet and I just sort of could go wherever I wanted I that's had two right. German shepherds so just a little girl and two German shepherds <laughs> and I just cruised around and did, I had little forts that were made out of rocks and trees. Yes. So yes. Very similar kind of a thing, although it wasn't actually gifted to me as like a my my state, my homestead, but I I thought it was because not many other kids lived on the point. So I just thought it was it's my It's a space. great way to live. It really was. We were lucky. <laughs> so um, have you always known you wanted to be an artist? No. Um, I knew, actually I was really interested in sciences and, mm -hmm. and probably because that's what my family, all of my family are into. Uh, and, um, but I wasn't good at math, so that's a problem. Uh, but I was interested in the, in the curiosity side of science, like trying mm -hmm. to figure out how things worked. Um, and I liked writing quite a bit. Uh, and it wasn't until I went to, so I went to a, a, a private um, K through eight and it was heavy on literature, uh, very light on math and science, but, but kind of philosophy, that sort of thing. Um, and then I went to the worst public high school in my city. Uh, and <laughs> Good the, transition there. It, it, well, yeah, it was really tough. But the only good thing about it was we, there was a, a fantastic uh, art professor or art teacher there. Um, and she kind of showed me that this could be a, a viable way to to live and and not to brag but oh, I, i'll brag on her um out of that program came uh jeremy scott the fashion designer who uh -huh. yeah like dresses lady gaga and Katy perry and all those people uh and uh, uh a woman who um was a curator for the louvre and i mean we had like 
it's just amazing how those little, great mentors yeah. can really yeah. find talent and unexpected places sometimes. I was at the bottom of that, but you know, well, those guys did incredible you're doing things. Pretty well. A lot of artists and illustrators came out of there. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so was it during that time that you decided art would be your path? Mm -hmm. That was my next question. She um, uh, got me a scholarship to the Kansas City Art Institute for a mm -hmm. summer program. And so I think I was maybe a sophomore or junior. Um, and so, and, and right next to that are two museum spaces, you know, big museum and then the H&R Block space. So I got to spend time at those places. And, and yeah, that kind of solidified that whole thing for me. I had inspiration yeah. right there. Um, so what has your art education been like since then? So we've started with the high school and uh, I, the summer program. But. I started in, uh, um, at Central Missouri State, or no, I'm sorry, U University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, which again was right across from the Art Institute. And it allowed me to take classes at the Art Institute for the price of tuition that the University of Missouri, oh, cool. Kansas City had, because um, I was paying for my own school and it was really expensive. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time over there. They ended that program and I transferred to uh, Central Missouri State University and did illustration. Um, and then did freelance illustration for five years and then went back to school and got a master's degree in painting. Okay, and I know you have continued that and are an educator yeah. yourself now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, about your, um, I don't know which is your side job, whether you're painting it or you're <laughs> teaching, but I, I, I know you have, and then I also know you have a business, so you're a busy guy. I say but. two full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, uh, I teach at a small college, um, community college, uh, and that was another thing that was really kind of tricky. I wasn't sure um, what sort of academic career I wanted to have. Uh, I Actually, I didn't want to teach uh, when I started, um, and I ended up doing that uh, as a graduate student, and I kind of liked it. And so um, I sort of found that it balanced out the studio life, which is pretty mm -hmm. intensely solitary. Um, and I needed that other side to, to make me whole. Um, and so uh, when we moved, well, actually before that, um, when I decided I was going to teach, um, I wanted to teach somewhere smaller. Um, I'd kind of seen like what the bigger universities could could do to uh, a, a person, and it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I could maybe have a little more impact if I taught at a smaller school. And so, yeah, um, it's a small college. Uh, we serve primarily the um, uh, Shoshone and Arapaho, mm -hmm. um, Wind River Indian Reservation. Um, and I have great students. Yeah, um, and we met one of your students who we were yes. showing at the gallery, yeah. and we already yeah. did a podcast yeah. with Talissa, so that was fun um, to hear her perspective. For sure. Um, how far do you commute to the school, or is it in, it's it, not in Lander? No, no it's, I it's almost 30 miles away. Okay. Yeah, so I commute. Um, and then this, I think we can kind of actually merge these both directions. Do you find that your students influence your work? Um, because ne my next question was about if you had a mentor or someone influential in your career, but I think that can go both directions. And sort of the lessons you've gotten maybe from both, from the students and to the mentors along the way. Yeah. I don't think my students necessarily influence my work, but because I'm teaching um, sort of fundamentals over and over again, I find a new, a new way to kind of incorporate that mm -hmm. into my work and then uh, bring that back into the classroom, so. Did you have a mentor, aside from your teacher in high school? Did you have others, or was that kind of the primary? Actually, I did. So I, I should backtrack. I think it was it was my seventh grade teacher. We didn't mm -hmm. have art in my private school, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. um, I wish we would have. But I did draw a lot. And uh, she kind of saw that in me. She's pretty observant. And she gave me, I don't know if you're familiar with the photographer, Elliot Porter. Um, maybe... I, I, he would have been a contemporary of Ansel Adams for a okay. while, and he jumped onto the color photography side of things. So, kind of when Adams was mm -hmm. was probably almost done with photography, um, and and he was a nature photographer. And she bought me this beautiful book um, and gave it to me when I graduated eighth grade, and yeah. I still have it. Um, but I think she saw that in me and encouraged it. Like I do remember bringing drawings into class, you know, a little seventh mm -hmm. grade boy, and showing her these drawings and and like wanting praise probably, but um, she had really insightful things to say about it. And, and, and I guess it was, you know, that was the late, late 70s, probably mm -hmm. early 80s. So uh, a really tricky time to, you know, um, for me to have some positive influence. But 
also in my own family, my parents were always really um, supportive. So I'm mm-hmm. kind of lucky, I think, that you know a lot of artists' stories aren't like that. I mean, it's interesting because as we're starting to interview people, everyone we've spoken to has had a supportive family for their art, and it probably does help people go a little bit tremendously further and, and be willing to embrace it as a yeah. part of their. Um, but that is, that's not the story you typically hear. The follow-up to that is about the lessons, you, the most important lesson you feel like any of these kind of mentors for, have taught you. Well, so for my, I, I, like I said, I grew up in the Midwest and it was mm-hmm. work ethic. You know, mm-hmm. that was something that my, my dad definitely uh, sort of pounded into me. And, and um, that I think is probably the number one thing that I, I think makes an artist have some sort of longevity is being able to just stick with it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so definitely work ethic. And then um, my high school art teacher, Mrs. Vesey, if she's ever happens to stumble upon this, <laughs> uh, uh, she really pushed this idea of um, experimentation in work. Um, so unlike a lot of other high school art programs that I see now, or, or even then, um, it, there wasn't this sort of rote formulated way to you know maybe get to some sort of um competition or something like that uh she worked more with like she was constantly giving she was a practicing working artist she was showing and so she was constantly showing us what she did um really pushing us to try a lot of media experimentation which is what i still do today um and that yeah that was huge um and and i didn't realize it then but no that's unusual to have that early education yes. where you're being encouraged to be experimental. Yeah. Um, and you've hit on actually a bunch of things I have follow-up questions specific to your work about. But, but first, just in general, because we always ask this, if you can tell us what your studio and painting process is. How okay. do you approach that? I currently have two studios. Um, so I have one at my house, uh, right outside of my house. And I have one, I own the house behind me. And I have one in the uh, kind of an old garage in, in in that area too. Um, the I, I have to tell you a little bit about the the setting too. So my house was built in 1902 and I love really old things in general. I love old houses, I love old architecture. Um, and our town was founded in like the 1880s, so it's a pretty, you know, for that town, town it's, for yeah, it's definitely. Uh, old house for that town and it, actually an old town for the last yeah yeah it was the last of a rail stop Mm -hmm. um and so um but i think that has an impact on the way i work too everywhere i've lived has always been in an older place um i've always had studios in older places as well and so the the studio next door is a was originally a part of our house i think they built it in the 40s but it's made out of the same brick um and it's got a lot of i don't know it feels lived in and i and i like that quality that's sort of like um, you know people have existed in this space before. And so that has an impact on how I make, too. Um, I want my work to sort of feel like it has some of those qualities. I've always been drawn to that. So most of my work has this, it, well, the surfaces are worked over. Mm-hmm. Um, I incorporate, like, the atmosphere of that into Almost like eroded work. surfaces sometimes. Yes. Do you switch between the two studios? Yes. And so do you have different work in the two studios? Yeah. I do. Uh, my the one by my house is mostly oil painting, um, and I, again, I'm, I I use all kinds of media, but it's mm-hmm. mostly that sort of stuff. The other one it tends to be mostly water based, and it's also where I stretch out my canvas because it's a little bit bigger. Um, I had to get a shipping container, which is also in the driveway, to hold all the the all your stuff. Materials. Um, so I'm adding on to that studio. Uh, probably in the fall so that okay. I can move the shipping container out. My neighbors will be happy. Um, it was temporary. Uh, but yeah, I like the being able to shift back and forth. So sometimes if, if like in the oil painting studio, things aren't going well, I'll walk over to the other studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my neighbors all know that at two o'clock in the morning before a show, I might be carrying, you know, a 60 by 60 inch canvas in the snow around the corner to the other studio. So there's always this back and forth between those things. That, and, and yeah, it's kind of a system I've worked out. It's a little bit funny, but it works. I can see how that inspiration sometimes like things being too much the same would get maybe tedious. And yeah. so, I um, mean, we certainly see that in your work that you have kind of a type of subject, but it moves all over the place it in does. terms of, and we are gonna come back to that. Um, other kind of just fun, easy questions. What do you listen to when you paint? Do you listen to 
Uh, sometimes music, but most of the time podcasts okay. and then a lot of audiobooks. That I, I like the audiobook thing. Actually, that that helps sometimes because, um, you know, every once in a while it just feels like sometimes I guess a chore it could be you know mm -hmm. and and having something else to draw me in um, while I'm working can be sort of nice um, yeah the romantic part of, of art making it you're not always in that uh, I don't know no. television world of yeah you know, everything's yeah. clicking and going right and it's just great sometimes it's like brushing your teeth you just do it you get you have to do it well most of those ideas are constructs we all right have that. <laughs> and, and the more artists we talk to here the more that becomes apparent but it's it's about hard work and keeping your nose down and like the people who are most successful take it seriously as a job and approach it that way and, and I, that's what we find it, it's a cliche quote but it's but i always i enjoyed it it still makes sense now is that you know let, let inspiration find you working so mm -hmm. um i i had a mentor at or a teacher at um kansas city Art institute named warren roster that would constantly uh, well, the thing you didn't want to do is say you didn't have an idea. So if you mm -hmm. didn't have an idea, um, he would make you paint chairs, like just chairs in the corner. Um, and the reason was is you were still painting. And mm -hmm. so you were either going to get really bored and come up with something, or you were just going to get really good at painting chairs, I guess. But you were still painting. So yeah. So to bring together kind of a bunch of topics we've touched on, talking about your education, which kind of makes it fun. It all is going to work together. Um, we notice that you use a lot of different materials in your work, some of which you even make. Um, that must be that scientist in you coming out bit. in your art production. Um, how do you choose the materials you're using for paintings? Because you, we have, even in this show, a, a range of materials. We've had shows with a totally different feel and direction. Yeah. Um, and it's made it fun because um, People, you were known for your wildlife images, and we'll come back to that. But it's they come, they manifest in so many different ways. Um, yeah. and they all still are very apparently yours, which I think is great for us to see. Um, but how do you pick your materials? Um, and also, what made you decide to start making some of your own materials? Probably. Well, I got to backtrack again. I w I w I would think I was in maybe a s uh, junior in high school. I saw a Jim Dine show at. Um, the Nelson Art Gallery. You familiar? You know Jim Dine's work. No. Um, he's painterly, uh, um, kind of post pop, mm -hmm. um, but 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 was around the whole pop thing. Mm -hmm. um, but did it in this very painterly, almost homemade way. And that's what he said. Like he liked his work to look homemade instead of very European and clean at the time, um, and and not uh, Andy Warhol slick. Um, mm -hmm. And and he is this master of materials. So uh, everything from sculpture to printmaking to painting to, every, you know, auto paints and things. I got really inspired by that at that early age because I was around all these other sort of non-traditional art materials and I thought you can incorporate those things. You know, this is early in my career. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and so that stuck with me. And then as most uh, artists probably have done. I worked construction for a while uh, and I really just enjoyed working with my hands and then like using mm. all of these materials. And so for me, I've never seen the art material as sort of a sacred thing. I see it as just a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So everything works. It's just whatever gets you to the to the bigger idea. What made you decide to start making your own paints and inks? Um, and can you talk about that process a little? You've spoken to us about it a little bit before. Um, with another show that we did um, in a live audience setting. But yeah. um, just kind of briefly, if you want to talk about how, and then on that note, do you feel like this diverse media um, help keep things fresh for you and also help kind of, do you choose them based on which kinds of subjects and how you're feeling at a time? Sort of all, it's an all-encompassing question about that okay. relationship between your media, which is ex fairly experimental. Probably, I get bored really easy mm -hmm. and the fresh thing that was yeah yeah <laughs> and so and so being able to like switch over to a different medium um sometimes it's for a very, very practical reason like whatever i'm using isn't working to define the subject the way i want it to or to create mm -hmm. the atmosphere i'm working with so uh sometimes it's that um other times it's maybe things are going really well um but i feel like it lacks something unexpected and I want to sort of be surprised so I'll grab something that I think this might work of course I mean archivally they work together but um, conventionally it's not something you would normally 
you know, mm-hmm. use, um, and I'll and I'll just try it and see what happens. And sometimes it's a disaster, and other times it leads to something really interesting. But I know I can just layer it up, mm-hmm. and having that um, confidence that I can I can make it work is really fun for me. That's what's yeah. really interesting to me. And so for for making my own mediums, like I make some of my own inks, and um, I have made my own paints before. Um, a, a lot of that is just out of pure curiosity because I mm-hmm. just want to know what's going to happen. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll make some strange concoctions, especially if it's water-based because it's a little easier to deal with that way. Um, binding like marble dust and um, uh, pigments, dry pigments, and then um, adding in some stuff that I use for sizing um, canvases to hold it all together. and. Uh, and just see what happens. I'll do little test panels, but a lot of times I'll just go straight onto the work and and see what kind of effects that will have. You mentioned the archival quality of things. Do you ever have concerns about experimenting too much and the long-term archival aspect, or is that stuff you kind of know what you're Not anymore. With? I did, I, I mean, in Early the earlier in. days, yeah. But that work probably, it, I don't think it ever went anywhere. Right. Like so, But once I figured out, you know, what will stick and what won't stick, and, mm-hmm. you know, I've read the books and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, there are some great messes in history. Absolutely. Experimenting. Yeah. The Last Supper being, you know, the most famous of yes. those. <laughs> yeah. Experimenting with the media didn't work out in that case. Well, or it did. Yeah. It's part of its mystery. And I mean, I think art takes on its own life anyway, once it's out of the hands. That comes back to the intention question. Which... Agree. When I saw Anselm Kiefer's work for the first time, mm-hmm. um, and I think it was at the Nasher in Dallas, and there were sunflower seeds all over the floor that had fallen off one of the paintings. Oh. And I talked to somebody about it, and they said, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. You just have to glue them back on. I mean, I didn't think that that gave me a pass, but I also thought, like, well, it's an interesting idea, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, once you put it out, it depends on how you view. Once you put it out in the world, if it's, it's the piece's it's journey living. at that point. I want that physical material feel to it. Mm-hmm. I, I very rarely, sometimes I'll work really smooth, but very rarely. Yeah. Um, but I want that... Um, Partially in control, partially unexpected, partially like it's doing its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a weird little balance for me. I think it's because I'm a middle child. I do have a, a piece in there called Middle Child in I, this show. I know. Yeah, it's, it's after me. <laughs> <laughs> it's your alter ego in a bear form. A sweet bear form. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. Very large bear. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, actually, so that's, that was a good transition. Uh, your work seems to convey a psychological connection to the animals that you paint. Um, so we've talked so much about the surface in mm-hmm. terms of that, uh, like we said, almost kind of, um, they're almost like relics in some ways that your pieces, but um, there is that really connected quality to many, many of the animals that you paint um, in terms of their eyes and that psychological that, um, relationship. Do you feel this connection or is that something that the audience is transferring onto it? Um, and do you have a favorite animal subject to paint? I do feel the connection. And and again, I'm an introvert. And so as you know, alone time, solitude, loneliness, whatever you want to call it, is pretty comfortable for me, and I, mm-hmm. I really enjoy that. Um, and so, you know, I spent all my childhood outside by myself looking at animals. Um, and we had a bunch of animals on the farm, but, you know, there were quite a few deer, uh, coyotes, things like that. Um, and when we moved out here, I spent a lot of time looking at animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I feel very connected to them. Uh, in fact, I feel like more comfortable out and about in the Wind Rivers by myself than I do probably anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, uh, yeah, I hope that connection comes through. I think it does a lot of times. Um, I mean, that's why I think that's why your work is, I mean, it's beautiful work, but I think that aspect is what really draws um, people in. And we have collectors of your work already. It's relatively new to the gallery and we have people who have multiple pieces. And I think that's why they see new relationships with the different, animals. Do you have a favorite thing to paint? I like painting horses. Uh, I mean, honestly, no, I don't have a, yeah, just depends on kind of what space you're in. Yeah. Do the animals vary the more wild ones versus the more domestic ones? Does that have any reflection of kind of what you're doing or just what you happen to be painting at that? When I, well, like horses, I see them constantly. (laughs) Um, Wyoming probably has more horses than people. Um, and so, and I grew up with horses too. Um, 
So that very familiar. It comes up a lot, yeah. And and the the ones in this show are sort of like archetypes. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily illustrated horses. I wouldn't say they're 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 more of a stand-in for the bigger idea. Um, and what are those ideas? Well, I mean, I love this uh, this thing that that horses are so Western and and but they're and so American or whatever. But um, you know, they're transplants like cattle um these aren't native no. um but we've kind of adopted them as this symbol of the west and so um that's part of it and the other part is i just uh i mean i loved having horses as a kid mm -hmm. um i felt a real emotional connection to them but i also felt it with cows we had cows i, I there's a picture of me sleeping on top of a milk cow like out in the field as a, <laughs> as a child um i'm just laying on you know my my uh, dad, I think, took the picture, but my mom said that I used to do it all the time. Uh -huh. And she was worried that I was going to get crushed because I would fall asleep in the summertime on top of a milk cow out in the field. <laughs> um, and by the way, I'm, I'm vegan. <laughs> it's kind of funny say, growing up on a farm. I, well, <laughs> no, when you talk about that connection, if I get too close to cows, I, have, I live in um, grazing land. And sometimes I let people put cows or horses yeah. on the property, and I'm, I can't do the cows or, unless I want to change my diet it's, and it's it's difficult because i just i was like i can't look them in the eyes and they're so sweet and then go on. so i have to kind of have it be separate or maybe make a big change i debate that but yeah it's i mean it's difficult and and it's something that even when i was a kid i had a hard time with mm -hmm. so um and my parents again were very understanding Supportive about that. that yeah and and that wasn't really a thing you know uh, i guess in the late 70s you didn't really hear that very often where i was yeah. from in the midwest yeah. but um yeah, I just. I had a phase where I wouldn't eat eggs once I realized that they had a whole <laughs> potential life in them. <laughs> I was four. We had a um, a cafe restaurant, and uh, I, was, I banned eggs from my diet. So maybe not. <laughs> also in the late seventies. <laughs> so we had some parallels in our <laughs> in different places. But um, and you talk about that kind of notion of the iconic West because you also paint the really wild animals right. like our actual of the West um, as this area and certainly it sounds like maybe Lander's faring better in terms of getting the pressure from the rest of the world on it. But we have been really um, in kind of the crosshairs of growth uh, here in Northwest Montana. Um, do you feel like the reasons for picking your subjects and painting them have shifted along with this kind of change in terms of our, our landscapes that are obviously so dear to us? For sure, that's a great, that's a really pointed question actually um, for this show too. Uh, because, yeah, I think when I first started painting wildlife, I was thinking more of the, oh, constable, pastoral idea. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not translating yeah. that, but just this, you know, sort of man in, in tune with nature or, or nature mm -hmm. without human. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and that was, drove me for a little while, but then um, I'm more aware, like there's some pieces in this show called the fragment, part mm -hmm. of a fragment series. And they're they're sort of That's layered, really yeah, and they're layered over each other um, to show sort of this breaking up of landscape, and mm -hmm. and also I I think there's something beautiful about that too, um, because there's this history of of land use, you know, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of places we could go with that, but um, when I look at an area, especially the Midwest now, when I go back to the Midwest, mm -hmm. it's this sort of messy patchwork of everybody owns everything and there's no just open country anymore that's that's conflicting um and and interesting because animals don't care about our boundaries yeah. so uh i think that's sort of an interesting place to to explore a little bit there's a, a piece in the show with the deer um curled up and mm -hmm. sort of layered over um a, a patchwork of remnant canvases that i had uh left over from other um projects that i keep saving stuff and I just kept layering them up over the top of that. And I like, and, and it was actually a deer that was in the yard right behind us I took a picture of. Um, and I like this idea of this sort of womb-like uh, mm -hmm. tiny little um, deer and then and then all of this broken up land sort of scarred up area around it. Well, um, and they do, you know, the fawns yeah. of course do hide and the yeah. moms leave them hidden yeah. because that's actually safer. Um, we have a pretty big piece of property here that we're not breaking up right now, although people like to ask, but I don't want it broken up. Um, but we put some bike trails on it, <laughs> and we were riding out, and 
right off of our little trail was like a baby fawn curled yeah. up. And I was like, oh. so we went a different way home. I didn't want to get too close, but it was such a sweet thing. And the mom was watching us. She yep. was watching us, but not coming over because that they're much more protected without being drawn attention to. So it was a pretty moment that I think happens all the time, but usually you don't see them. And I think that intersection is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, again, uh, with horses, horses kind of change travel essentially. And mm -hmm. so um, there's a couple pieces with horses, that archetypal horse, and, and they have that layering process as well. And that's the same idea of, of um, you know, this, this fragmented landscape, mm -hmm. but um, maybe partially due to the horse in a way. Oh, so uh, Well, and so they were such an iconic part of yeah. the shifts in the West and both amongst the Native Americans mm -hmm. and the different ways the different tribes interacted with each other and with um, Westerners. But yeah, certainly the horse is a powerful figure in the West, quote, in quotes. Um, yeah. But it's interesting to kind of really examine that. And it continues to be. People want this to be a cowboy town now that it's kind of transitioning and it really wasn't a cowboy <laughs> town <laughs> it was a railroad town and a logging town yeah um but it's starting to turn into a little bit of a ranchy town because that's what the newcomers sort of envision in that west and it's beautiful and picturesque and scenic in that way too so i'm not even against that i just think it's an interesting switch sort of the um as you said the archetypes that people want in a place and the things they expect and I like to, uh, I think that's interesting too. I like to see, yeah, I try to not pass judgment necessarily on oh. any of it. I just like to see how things change. Um, well, and we've been talking about nostalgia in yeah. here. I talked about, you know, there's the nostalgia for what was for people who grew up here, but also for people from other places trying to create a nostalgic idea right. of what they maybe missed or had been lost. Um, so it's a really interesting time if you could step out of feeling upset about traffic. Or, <laughs> I work on that. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite piece in this collection? Um, and is there a story behind it? You've already spoken about the, I the, like the fragmented deer piece. Yeah, I like the fawn. I like um, that one too. I think that's my favorite also. And I like the, the horse on the sort of red mm -hmm. uh, background. Um, and, and that one, uh, I think I, I think it's titled "When the Day Is Done." Um, that one texturally uh, is really, really thick, sort of paint over canvas, over paint, over canvas, over paint, over canvas. Um, and I just kept layering that that stuff up. I had, uh, and I don't use red very often in that way. No, so I was, haven't seen much I, red. I thought that was kind of. I think we put it in the front window. I think so. To be really dramatic <laughs> up there. <laughs> um, do you often layer your canvas with paint like that? Because you talked about it a couple times in this. So is that really a reference to this moment of kind of the fracture of the landscape? Yeah. I've used collage a lot mm -hmm. in the past, but more paper and a little more um, kind of like straightforward collage with something worked back over the top of it and maybe little bits. But this time I really used it to cover pieces of the painting up and then work the painting back over the top and then cover pieces of it up again. And I would peel it back off. And oh, um, cool. yeah, so there's little remnants of things all over the place. Kind of um, glimpses into the past yeah. of the painting. Yeah. Very cool. Um, is there, and we've kind of touched on this, I think, is there a dialogue you wish to generate through your work? I'm not a political artist, honestly. Uh, I, I, I love the process and I mean, honestly, at the at, and again, it sounds cliche, but at the end of it, I just want connection in some way with the viewer, right? So mm -hmm. some sort of communication, um, and and I mean, I'm also after some sort of feeling or or emotive idea. I know transcendence is a terrible thing to say in modern times, but um, I still think it's interesting because mm -hmm. um, whatever that thing is, you know, when uh, and I've stood in front of a lot of great paintings, and I'm not comparing myself to any of those people, that's for sure. But um, what is that transcendent thing that like a, a, a Van Gogh has or a Monet has, or a, I don't know, tons, tons of painters, right? Like um, mm -hmm. uh, we were just talking about Lucian Freud a little while ago, me and Shauna, um, you know, why do some paintings do that and some paintings don't? Whatever that yeah. quality is, that's what I wanna find. And I still don't know what that is, but every once in a while I feel like I might be stepping in the right direction. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so I think that's also part of the experimentation. Is yeah. So while you're not political, you certainly are conceptual. These are not just sort of pretty pictures. These have no, like I'm a trying to, big thought process I'm trying, to them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. There certainly is the psychological connection. I think right. it's very apparent to most people that there is a way that you interact with the figures on the canvas. But this notion of, um, I'm really fascinated about the notion of the fractured landscape yeah. and kind of recreating that with the canvases. So. And in transcendence, I mean, that's a interesting. I mean, you mentioned Van Gogh, which people love so much. And I'm like, nobody would want to be him, however. No. Such a tormented soul to have been so popular on dorm room walls. Well, and, <laughs> and, and you know. I, I find that always so fascinating when I teach it, too. And and to see them in, see them in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first one I ever saw was in Philadelphia. Um, and it was in a weird contemporary art mm -hmm. room. It didn't make any sense. There was like a Duchamp and then there was a Van Gogh. It's kind mm -hmm. of this odd thing. They're famous works. And it, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it jumped off the wall compared yeah. to everything else. And so. then I got to go to Amsterdam and spend time mm -hmm. at the Van Gogh Museum yeah. and all those fantastic. other great places. Um, yeah. And and yeah, that, you know, not all of them do it, but there are ones that just, they vibrate, they resonate. Still to mm -hmm. this day, whatever that thing, that truthful thing, whatever that is. Yeah, that they energy have that. is far beyond what his personal yeah. torment was, and it yeah, it has endured. I guess that's about putting that piece out there in the world and yeah. seeing where it takes you. Um, well, this is fascinating. I feel like we could keep going, but we've touched on a lot of great topics. Um, one last question, which isn't going to be as relevant this time because you're leaving before the opening. But do you have a favorite beverage? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, I'm a coffee drinker. I mean, okay. we do own, we do own a bakery and a coffee That's shop, right. so I drink a lot of coffee. Um, yeah. And right now it's summer, so it's iced coffee. Perfect. Um, yeah, iced Americanos all day. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time, Matt. It's super fascinating, and we're excited to get to spend time with the work again now that we've talked about it so much. Thank you. Thank you.